Hello YouTube! I know I said I was going to be getting back on the Meta Ethics series, and I will do, but uh, right now I want to talk about The Repugnant Conclusion, which was originally developed by Derek Parfit. Now, The Repugnant Conclusion is often presented as a problem for utilitarians, so I hope you all know, all know what utilitarianism is. Utilitarianism is uh, theory and ethics that in its classical form says an action is morally good insofar as it maximises happiness. Uh, when deciding what is the morally right thing to do, all you need to ask yourself is, will this bring about the most amount of happiness? Um, this theory leads to many problems. One of them is the repugnant conclusion. Let's imagine three worlds. First, there's world A. World A has a population of, say, a million people. And they're all living extremely good lives. They're incredibly happy. Their lives are rich and fulfilling. They travel all around the world. They have a great education. They all live a long time and so on. They have the best lives you could imagine. On this graph, the height represents the goodness of the lives. It's very, very, very good. And uh, the width shows the number of people. So it's not actually that many million people. Uh, let's say that their lives have a value of 100. So overall, that's 100 times a million. Second, there's world A+. A+, is exactly the same as A, except there's an additional group of 1 million people living slightly worse lives. Still very good lives, just worse than the absolutely fantastic lives of the first group. Their lives are of value 80, so the average for this world is 90. Um, now here's an essential claim. A+, plus is no worse than A. A plus is just as good as A. If we're classical utilitarians, this conclusion is pretty much irresistible. All we've done here is create more happiness. It's, it's the same as A, but we've added some more people whose lives are also very good. Um, I mean, consider the following worlds. Uh, world 1 is like our standard world, except there are no sentient beings. World 1 plus is the same, but with sentient beings living very good lives. Uh, the intuition should be that one plus is better. Certainly it's not worse. How could the mere addition of sentient beings living very good lives be worse? Uh, certainly for a classical utilitarian, you know, that's, you know, they're going to accept that that's going to be better. So we can see how this applies to our argument. World A and A plus bear the same relation as world one and one plus. In each case, all we have is the mere addition of sentient beings living very good lives. Finally, world B. B is composed of two million people, and they all live very good lives, lives of value 91. Now, B is surely better than A+, plus, since the worse-off group gains more than the better-off group loses. The worse-off group gains uh, 11, the better-off lose 9. Um, so that must be better. So we have the following. A plus is just as good as A. Uh, B is better than A+. Plus. And this leads to the conclusion B is better than A. OK, so it should be kind of obvious what the problem here might be. We can apply uh, the same kind of argument to world B that we applied to world A, leading to a world C with 4 million people whose lives have a value of, say, 75. And you know C is better than B, so therefore C is better than A. And we can repeat this until we get to world Z. And this contains billions and billions and billions and billions of people whose lives are barely worth living. And we end up with the conclusion that Z, a world full of people whose lives are barely worth living, is better than A. And this is what Parfit finds repugnant. This is the repugnant conclusion. I mean, we can make the point much more quickly this way. Each life in A has, say, 100 units of happiness and there are a million people, giving us 100 times a million units of happiness. Each life in Z has only one unit of happiness, but there are billions and billions and billions of them, which means there's much more happiness overall than in A. OK, there are three things to note, first of all. So, first, while the lives in Z are barely worth living, they're not terribly bad. They're not in constant agony or anything like that. 
Parfit calls World Z a world of muzak, which is like boring elevator music, and potatoes. It's a world of muzak and potatoes. Elevator music and potatoes. It's a drab and boring world. There's nothing of great value in it. Uh, it's just, it's just kind of drab. It's grey, you know, boring. But it's not terribly bad. Second, note that this is merely a hypothetical problem. It's a problem for theoretical ethics, not for practical ethics. If we want a complete ethical theory, and many people do, then we need it to deal with merely possible cases. In practice, there are all sorts of reasons why we shouldn't try to radically expand the population. One significant point is that overpopulation is becoming a serious problem, particularly due to the environmental consequences. Our impact on the environment is becoming so severe that we're threatening the very processes that allow this planet to sustain complex civilizations. So if we drive the population much higher, we're going to end up with lots of lives that aren't worth living at all. So the repugnant conclusion doesn't tell us to go forth and multiply. We're being asked in, in this uh, we're being asked with this hypothetical to keep everything else equal. We're imagining worlds where overpopulation isn't a problem. Third, although I've sort of presented the repugnant conclusion as a problem for utilitarians, it's not only a problem for utilitarians. And the reason should be kind of obvious. We we all have some sort of obligation to make the world better, to increase welfare. We might not agree with the utilitarian that maximising happiness or maximising pleasure or whatever is the only moral goal, but evidently it is good to increase happiness. Uh, I think it would be kind of weird to deny that. Um, and in any case, actually, we could probably run the repugnant conclusion for all sorts of other things. So if you're a virtue ethicist, then you could say that the Z world contains just enough virtuous action to make those lives worthwhile, whereas the A world is incredibly virtuous. Um, Parfit says that the repugnant conclusion results from the impersonal total principle, which is that other things being equal, the best outcome is the one in which there would be the greatest quantity of whatever makes life worth living. Which strikes me as a fairly plausible principle, whether you're a utilitarian or not. But if we're not utilitarians, what might we say? Well, one immediate point in, is that in A+, plus there's inequality, and inequality is a bad thing. So A+, plus is worse than A. Now, this blocks the argument from the start. So we, we immediately from the start, we don't get the first step. We don't get the claim that A plus is just as good as A. So uh, that blocks the argument to the conclusion. Problem is, it's not clear that this actually works. Um, personally, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with some inequality. Uh, inequality isn't just in itself obviously bad all the time. You know, some inequality is is OK, in my view. Um, however, even if you disagree with that, even if you think that inequality is necessarily bad, there are two ways we can kind of flesh out A plus to neutralise this problem. First of all, there, there needn't be inequality in the sense of, of social inequality. So the groups in A plus um, may all have the same kinds of lives. Perhaps the second group, with who have the sort of lower welfare, just have slightly gloomier dispositions. Um, or we could imagine that the two groups have no relation to one another. They're totally different species living on different planets. Um, so, you know, that it's not sort of, we're not necessarily imagining a society where there are class differences or anything like that. Um, and also note that even if you, even if you still feel that any kind of inequality is somehow necessarily bad, A plus could still be better than A, since the badness of the inequality might be outweighed by the gain in the overall happiness. So it's not really obvious that appealing to, to inequality helps. Right, so to reiterate, the repugnant conclusion tells us that a world containing billions and billions and billions of people whose lives are barely worth living is better, in fact it may be significantly better, uh, than a world containing only one million people whose lives are absolutely fantastic. There are many ways we might try to block the repugnant conclusion, but more recently a number of philosophers have argued that we should simply accept it. Uh, the main reason for this is probably because all the other responses end up running into problems that are just as bad. So let me illustrate this by considering probably the most intuitive response, which is to say that what we have to consider is not the total utility of a world, but the average utility. So you can't just 
add up the value of each life. You have to consider the average of them all. Uh, now on this view, the utility of world A is 100. Uh, everybody, everybody's lives is at 100. The utility of A plus is 90, because half the population are at 100, half are at 80. And the utility of world Z is 1. So A plus is worse than A, and Z is much worse than both. Basically, if you adopt the average utility view, then the mere addition of new lives makes a world worse if the value of those lives is, is below the average. And I think there's some, you know, there's some intuitive support for this. If you don't get the intuition, uh, um, consider this example from uh, Thomas Herker. Suppose we compare two art galleries. The first art gallery contains like the greatest masterpieces of art that you can think of, like uh, Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock and Cy Twombly, you know, abstract expressionism, all the really, really good art. The second art gallery has exactly the same paintings, but it also contains some lesser paintings. Still good, but, you know, not really great, like, you know, Vermeer and Rembrandt. Um, now, Thomas Herker suggests that the second gallery is worse. The, the mere addition of other things of positive value has made the whole worse, because those other things aren't quite as good as the fantastic things that were there to begin with. And I can kind of see kind of see where he's coming from. Unfortunately, the average utility response doesn't work. The problem is that just as adding new lives of lower than the current average makes the world worse, so adding new lives of higher than the current average makes the world better. So consider a world in which there is one person experiencing 50 years of constant agony. This is the worst life imaginable. Now imagine the same world, except we add billions of people. And they all live for 50 years in constant agony. It's the worst life imaginable, except it begins with 10 seconds of pleasure. So we can you know, graph the two worlds like this. If, the, if average utility is what matters, then we have to say that this world, the first world, is worse than the second world. But surely it's worse for billions of people to be subjected to constant agony than it is for just one person to be subjected to constant agony. Even if the average utility with the billions of people is slightly higher. I, I'd say that the second world is obviously much worse than the first one. To say that you know, this world is better than this one is even more repugnant than the standard repugnant conclusion. So is clearly of no help whatsoever to appeal to average utility. Okay, so since the repugnant conclusion is a problem for many ethical theories, and since trying to reject it leads to problems that are equally bad or worse, we could try to accept it. So let's look at some strategies for accepting the repugnant conclusion. One strategy is fairly simple. I call it the footstomp strategy. It's essentially the argument Ethical theory X entails the repugnant conclusion. We should accept ethical theory X, therefore we should accept the repugnant conclusion. Ethical theory X might be classical utilitarianism. You know, accept the repugnant conclusion, but we should be classical utilitarians, so we should accept the repugnant conclusion. This probably sounds a bit question-begging. Um, if somebody's given the repugnant conclusion as a criticism of a particular ethical theory, then you know, wouldn't this just beg the question? But the real point here is, the mere fact that some theory has a counterintuitive consequence is not in itself a good reason to reject that theory. Uh, a counterintuitive consequence is at best only one consideration against a theory. Intuitions aren't totally inviolable. Uh, indeed, if you're committed to finding an ethical theory, you should expect it to have some counterintuitive consequences. If we say that intuitions are totally inviolable, then why would we need an ethical theory at all? We could just go with our intuitions. But a lot of philosophers want morality to have uh, a more secure foundation, so they try to search for the basic principles and how we apply these principles to particular situations and all this stuff. Um, and, and obviously there has to be some agreement with our intuitions. If a moral theory entailed that we should just like go out and rape and murder everyone we see, then I don't think anyone would be prepared to accept that theory. That, that's, that's far too counterintuitive. But sometimes we should be prepared to reject our intuitions. There are many other virtues that an ethical theory might have. For instance, simplicity. Many philosophers want their moral theory to have basic principles that are simple, 
that don't have lots of ad hoc adjustments. You know, you want a nice basic principle that can apply to many cases. The principle of classical utilitarianism is simply maximise happiness. That's a very good example of a simple theory. Uh, comprehensiveness. So we want our theory to apply to all possible cases. You don't want to end up in situations where the theory just doesn't give you an answer. It needs to be complete. Uh, unity. Not only should it apply to all cases, but uh, you know its principles need to be related. Uh, you don't want one principle for this and then something totally different for this. Any principle of classical utilitarianism will be derived from maximise happiness, so that's nicely unified. Consistency. Uh, we don't want it to give contradictory answers. And so on. There are other virtues we might want our theory to have, but you get the point. If a theory does well on all these counts, then we might say it just doesn't matter if it has some counterintuitive consequences. Especially if those counterintuitive consequences concern situations that are never likely to arise for anybody, as is the case for the repugnant conclusion. Just to mention um, where I stand on this, um, I don't really care about an ethical theory being simple or unified or comprehensive or whatever. Uh, but then I don't really care about having an ethical theory at all. I don't think that's the right approach. It seems like a lot of philosophers want to treat ethics like science or mathematics, but I'd rather just respect the messiness of our moral reactions. I'm happy to talk about you know, utility or rights or virtue or whatever. I don't really worry whether these different ways of talking can be made consistent uh, nor am I really interested in fleshing them out into strict theories, utilitarianism, Kantianism, virtue ethics. Uh, I guess this is all something for another video, though. Um, okay, so the the second strategy is to explain away our intuition. We have an intuitive rejection of the repugnant conclusion. The first strategy says, who cares? The second strategy says, let's look at why we have this intuition. And this will show us that we shouldn't trust it. So what might be the source of our intuitive rejection of the repugnant conclusion? Well, there are several factors. First of all, we're being asked to consider an extremely abstract problem. Philosophical thought experiments in general can become quite abstract. This one is particularly abstract. Notice that, you know, in, in an important sense, it's totally outside the field of our folk morality, our common sense morality. When we think about dealing with things on an everyday basis, or even with dealing with the kinds of problems that face society as a whole, we're never going to have to deal with things like the repugnant conclusion. It just doesn't arise in our day-to-day -day lives. It doesn't even arise as a political issue, a poli an issue within the country, and it probably never will do. So it's no surprise that our intuitions might give us the wrong answer, as it were. We simply have no need to think about cases like this. So what our intuitions say about cases like this, maybe, you know, we can dismiss it. Second, there's a good chance that we're confusing the question, which world is the better one, with which world would I prefer to live in? There's no doubt that when you ask which is the better world, you almost can't help taking the egoistic point of view and end up asking yourself which world you'd rather live in. But obviously, the question, which world would I rather live in, is a different question. Uh, this is obvious if we consider a case like this. Um, I'm, I'm a man. Let's suppose I'd, I was offered the choice to go to World 1, which is exactly like Ancient Greece. Or I go to World 2, which is exactly like Ancient Greece, except uh, the sort of attitudes to gender are totally reversed. And nobody experiences the pain of childbirth. Childbirth is totally painless. Ancient Greece, for those of you who don't know, was a, a deeply misogynist society. It's a rare example of a society that genuinely hated women. Women weren't just of a lesser status. They had no status. They were you know, genuinely hated. So in, in World 1, women are hated. Women have no opportunities. In World 2, this is reversed. Men are hated. Men have no opportunities. Well, I'd go for World 1. As a man, I'd obviously be better off in World 1. But if you ask me which is the better world... Well, it looks like World 2 is, because World 2, uh, the changes in World 2 are World 2 reverses the gender roles, which doesn't make any difference. Uh, the only thing that makes a moral difference is that there's less pain. Uh, so it would seem that, that World 2 is the better one. Um, so obviously we have to separate the question of which is the better world from 
which world would I prefer? But it can be difficult to do that. And that maybe is what's leading us to, uh, you know, reject the repugnant conclusion. Third, there's our inability to deal with large numbers. We just can't really conceive of big numbers. World A contains a million people, and this is already beyond the limits of our imagination. You can't really grasp what a million people is. Even if there was a gathering of a million people, it would just look like a big, blurry crowd. With higher numbers, it gets even worse. World Z contains billions and billions and billions, like maybe a Google people. It's a number far too large for us to have any kind of intuitive grasp on. Not only are we kind of not only can we not grasp large numbers, we're also bad at compounding small values. The classic example of this is the rice and chessboard problem. So there's a fable about a wise man who invented chess, and uh, the king was very pleased with the wise man's invention, and he agreed to give him a reward of his own choosing. The wise man says, "Take one grain of rice, put it on the first square of the chessboard, two grains on the next square, then four grains, then eight grains, and so on." doubling it each square for all 64 squares of the chessboard. Of course, the king was very pleased with this. Great, all he wants is a load of rice. But how much rice is this? The intuitive response is probably something like maybe tens of thousands of grains, maybe millions of grains. It's actually 18 and a half quintillion grains, or 18 and a half million, million, million grains of rice, which is far more far, far more than all the grains of sand on the earth. Um, and there are many other examples like this. We vastly underestimate just how quickly a very small value can become a very big one. What makes World Z so good is its enormous population. But this is precisely the factor that we can't comprehend, that we can't deal with in intuitive terms. When we think about World Z, especially when we compare it with A, we're able to consider the average welfare of each life. We can see that each life in A is significantly better than each life in Z, but we fail to appreciate the massive size of Z. Our, intu our intuitive reaction takes account of the average welfare, but it just can't take account of the different sizes of the populations. Fourth, there are cultural objections to large populations. In our world, there are severe pro problems created by overpopulation. For the last couple of decades, the problems of overpopulation have been drummed into our heads. So when we consider a thought experiment involving an extremely large population, even though we're explicitly setting the practical concerns of overpopulation to one side, it's natural for us to have an intuitive objection to, to this world. Uh, we can't help but see billions and billions and billions of people as being too many people. A more, a more painful example of this kind of thing is, imagine a man who's been brought up in a very racist environment, he's been taught that blacks are lazy and violent and prone to crime. As he's gotten older, he's seen that this isn't true, he's dropped the racist beliefs. But one day he's interviewing people for a job or whatever, a black man comes in and he just has a gut reaction of, this guy isn't right. Now, he can't help it, it's like a habit, because it's been drummed into his head. Uh, Rationally and intellectually, he knows that this black candidate may be perfectly fine for the job. But the point is, it can be very difficult to ignore our cultural baggage when we're making judgments. We, in, in our culture, have a bias against very large populations, and this bias will infect our intuitive reactions, even if we're explicitly putting the practical problems to one side. Rationally and intellectually, we know that it shouldn't affect our reaction, but it just does, we can't help it. Now, bear in mind that none of these four points is supposed to show that our intuitive gut reaction against the repugnant conclusion is wrong. Um, rather, it gives us a reason to be agnostic. So maybe the repugnant conclusion really is repugnant. Maybe our gut reaction gets it right. The point here is that our, our gut reaction, our intuition, can't be a good guide because we should expect our intuitions to be limited and biased. So, that gives us some reason to be sceptical of our intuition against the repugnant conclusion. And that should help make the repugnant conclusion seem more acceptable. So, the third strategy for de defending the repugnant conclusion is to look for independent arguments for the repugnant conclusion. Michael Humer tries this strategy. He gives a few arguments, but the only one that strikes me as even prima facie persuasive is his 
more is better argument. It's a nice simple argument, um, and here's his own summation of it. Worthwhile lives are good, more of a good thing is better, therefore increasing the number of worthwhile lives makes the world better. Do we think it's better to add more worthwhile lives to the world? Well, Humer um, makes a couple of points in defence of this. First, he suggests, he suggests we consider the symmetry between space and time. Most people want the human species to survive for as long as possible. The longer we're around, the better. Humor suggests that adding people elsewhere in space, um, you know, i.e. expanding the population, is as good as adding people elsewhere in time. Um, I don't find this point even slightly persuasive. I think we can just reject that space and time are symmetrical in this sense. Humor doesn't actually give an argument for this, he just says that they're symmetrical. Um, and I, I don't see why we should accept that. In fact, not only might there be a difference between space and time, there might be a difference between time and time, by which I mean future time and past time. Many people want the human race to survive for as long as possible. They want it to survive well into the future. But imagine it was discovered that humans emerged in the past millions of years earlier than we originally thought. The current thinking, as far as I know, is that humans have been around for about 100,000 years. Suppose we discover that we've been around for 10 million years. Would that be a cause for celebration? I don't think it would. It would just be an intriguing historical discovery. Beyond that, I don't think anyone would care. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think we can just, you know, reject this point. Humor also notes the symmetry between pleasure and pain. Um, he points out that if you know that a potential child will have an overall painful life, it would be bad to bring that child into existence. So, by analogy, if a child will have an overall pleasurable life, it would be good to bring him into existence. Uh, again, humour literally just, that, that, that's all he says on this point. Um, in fact, I'm almost quoting him verbatim there. Um, he doesn't really argue that pleasure and pain are symmetrical, he just says that they are. But again, I think we can simply reject that, that pleasure and pain are symmetrical in this way. In fact, it seems to me that intuitively, you know, we would say that... Um, you know, it's wrong to bring a child into the world if there's a good chance that they will have a very, very bad life. Um, but we wouldn't say that you've done anything wrong by failing to bring into existence somebody who would have a very good life. So it seems to me that intuitively there is, in fact, an asymmetry between pleasure and pain. Um, and humour doesn't give any argument for, for his view. Um, so... Uh, he does have another argument for this idea that more uh, lives are better, but that argument seems obviously question-begging, so I won't explain it. Anyway, Humor thinks he's shown that more worthwhile lives are better, in which case it's a short road to the repugnant conclusion. If we add enough lives with very low positive welfare, then we end up with a very great sum of welfare overall, greater than what you'd have in a small population with high welfare, which is just the repugnant conclusion. Um, okay, I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, we'll continue. Um, we'll continue this soon, uh, but that's all I want to talk about t today. We'll look at some more defences of the repugnant conclusion uh, in the next video. Thanks for watching. I'll be back very shortly.